Okay, so welcome to the last lecture of this uh, medical amazing course. And uh, in this lecture, uh, we will have just a overview of application of machine learning in medical amazing. By no means this is comprehensive. Nevertheless, I hope it would give you some idea. And uh, I guess because you are anyway had a look at some of the recent uh, papers from Mikai that should have already given you some idea at least on how uh, the trend is going on and uh, how the progress is being made uh, in the area of uh, application of machine learning in medical imaging, right? So the main references that I am going to, I have taken the content from is the first one is a 2017 uh, paper, uh, which is a survey paper or a review paper on application of deep learning in medical image analysis in general. And then in particularly for MR, I have looked at another paper, which is a relatively recent paper. Uh, it is in February 2019. This one is about deep learning in MR imaging. So the first one was medical image analysis journal. Uh, the second one is investigative magnetic resonance imaging journal. And another source from where I have taken, uh, uh, I'll again uh, cite it again while we are moving on, particularly what are the developments, some key developments that had happened in machine learning, those content I took uh, from this. Uh, kind of, I guess it's it's more like a blog where I found it interesting uh, way of summarizing things. Particularly, they picked up some ten top ten uh, are which they considered as very milestone architectures. They considered some ten CNN architectures. So that's something I have taken. And uh, there are of course here and there there are few other uh, references that I took, which I would um, cite some of them as we move on. Okay, this is the one I took the picture from there, uh, where they were mentioning, let's say the key CNN architectures, okay, so something around uh, at least till 2018, this has some key uh, CNN architectures, as most of you have already done at one or two courses um, in uh, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, I'm not going in detail to any of these things. I'm just going to cite their names here. And for those who have not yet done, anyway, you will come back to that probably in the next semester. So kind of a breakthrough um, is from the previous many decades that brought the breakthrough is this Linet 5 architecture, right? Yes, most of you who have done courses would be knowing this, this is the Linet 5 architecture that happened uh, uh, in the late 1998 or uh, yeah, in the beginning of 1999. Then again, there is some quiet period in terms of breakthroughs, although there are papers. So that again happened to AlexNet, right, in 2012, in the beginning of 2012. And then uh, I think uh, the more flooding of these methods started from 2014 again, uh, AlexNet is again a very significant breakthrough and after that VZZNet is an again a landmark one. Then there are this inception networks, ResNet, Exception and quite a lot dense net based architectures are also into the picture. Uh, well, that's as far as uh, in general machine learning is concerned. This is a graph that uh, tells you uh, like for example, you could al also do this. There is this uh, PubMed, most of you might be knowing it. It's a US, US National Library of Medicine National Institute of Health, NI, and this is something uh, from National Institute of Health, Health, NIH, okay? So the keywords use it just to see how the trends are going on. Uh, the first graph, uh, the, this is as of yesterday, I just took this uh, data and plotted these graphs. The first graph is uh, where I have the word machine learning either in the title or in the abstract or both. The second graph, and then these are the number of publications in the international um, recognized authentic journals. Um, starting, I plotted this for the last two decades from 2000 to 2020. Okay, the same thing I did just to also have a look at how deep learning uh, trend is going on again from 2000 to. 2020, 
okay and uh, you could see here if you consider per an year for example if there are around 500 it's up to you where you keep the threshold something i would say in my case uh, let's look at it uh, uh, let's say if you have a 500 publications at least that's when something has picked up here because see there will be publications where you might be using uh, something like a, a very earlyly available things are also there you yeah, maybe a svm model you might call it as machine learning um, uh, and so on and so forth so if you look at here something around alexnet has come around 2012 around the same time 2011 and 2012 this is when lot of noise has started here from 2010 so uh, in computer vision if you look at it a lot of happening started from linet itself linet 5 itself uh, there is always some lag when it comes to medical imaging when compared to the computer vision so it's a good news for those who are working in parallel both who are at least aware are preferably working in both areas of computer vision and medical imaging doing research in both they are the ones who could board the train early and have priority seats there okay so you could see here something picked up around 2010 here and of course these are more like cnn so you could consider them as uh, deep neural networks kind of stuff so that uh, deep learning so this next one that has been done is deep learning either in title or abstract you could see again with 500 okay uh, something started around 2017 so you could see there is a some uh, gap but it's not bad once it has picked up here uh, maybe the pickup is low but the speed is after that this has uh, progressed uh, uh, this has been the buzz thing okay in uh, this has been the trend now so even if you look at any recent conferences almost um, 80 to 90% of the papers are from machine learning and deep learning even in medical imaging so while saying 80% and 90% probably i am taking uh, on the lower end figures okay i am um, very uh, pessimistic perhaps the, those percentages are pessimistic um, you could see almost all going the trend so even if you look at the trend um, we are at to reach the peak okay this this term now we understood it quite well because of covid where we are looking at the graph and looking for Uh, it to reach to the peak okay then you would expect the gaussian or uh, similar curve to drop down so you could still see this is a still a kind of a good time for those who are working in machine learning and deep learning still this trend would definitely looks like continue for some time at least okay for few more years at least so you could see here for example 2200 3000 5000 then from 2018 to 19 a jump of around 3000 okay then again a jump of around 4000 so still it's it's going in a good pace okay same thing here uh, so it picked up uh, reasonably from 2017 uh, okay then around uh, uh, 1500 let's say then around 2000 then around 3000 again uh, there will be papers where you might not call it as deep learning or you might be calling it as deep learning but there could be an aberration from that still since we are considering it in the order of thousands of papers still it would uh, reliably or in a reasonable way would be representing the trends going on with that background let's also have some comparison with whatever is going in computer vision versus the kinds of problems and challenges that we have in medical imaging so if you ask any guy uh, means all of you most of you would be in a position uh, now to say a similar thing suppose if you are talking in computer vision three important problems at least are am among the important problems three uh, key problems okay um, uh, that a computer vision guy would be looking at to solve using machine learning or deep learning would be <clears throat> you would like to detect an object you would like to segment an object you would like to track an object of course there are few other problems also but if you have to uh, point out just three most important problems um, these are the very important things and then you could see you indeed have a very similar problems in medical imaging as well which have similarities to this there you want to detect an object perhaps here you want to 
detect a disease rather than an object and of course argon detection is also there or this could be an abnormality detection also so i think some of you already are aware of traumatic brain injuries which we talked about earlier and of course other injuries also there you would like to detect whether that abnormality is there or not okay or that particular disease is there or not or you want to detect a particular organ maybe when i say detect an organ it might not be like uh, detecting whether to there uh, that is there or not or even let's have having a region of interest that covers that okay then there is a segmentation there object segmentation when it comes to medical imaging your object is argon here and then there is an object tracking okay many of you uh, are working on that right uh, where the traffic in the traffic uh, vehicles monitoring and all video track in videos um, uh, tracking the objects tracking the human pedestrians and lot of things you are doing crowd counting and crowd uh, you know, how the trend of the crowds and all here also you have argon tracking also for example um you might be taking a ct scan or mr scan of the heart okay there is a movement or it could be for example um since you have done the mr imaging there could be a motion um or a movement uh, from one acquisition to the other acquisition that you are doing so you would like to track that or it could be an image guided surgery going on where um uh, you are tracking it okay those things with a uh, some amazing aspects so then as the patient is moving you want to track the argon so there are again uh, n number of problems in each of them sub problems you could uh, different the specific details could vary well in addition to them uh, in medical imaging there are also few other equally important problems um uh, here we are just um, uh, seeing uh, three such problems one could be detection of patterns or associations in population studies it's for example you have let's say um, brain mr images of lots of people in that population assume that uh, there is a, a subset of that population is having let's say alzheimer's disease or some dementia related stuff or uh, for that matter even if you don't know any of these two keywords there is some particular abnormality sub population is having some ab abnormality one important study uh, type studies that happen subset of studies that happen in medical imaging is to see um, whether you could observe any significant differences in any of the given structures or a normal population versus a population that that belongs to a particular category of abnormality sometimes from the medical anat anatomical or functional understanding from the domain knowledge you might suspect to observe some significant variations be it functionally be it uh, uh, structurally or something else okay in a particular population so in that case you would be carrying out studies where you will try to look at whether you observe them or not and uh, there could be cases where uh, you don't assume anything or you might not be having enough domain knowledge you would like to make an unbiased study unbiased used in a slightly uh, abused manner here unbiased is you are not considering any domain knowledge yet just you want to explore and see if you are doing a statistical study of the structural information or functional information uh, across the normal subjects versus the specific uh, targeted subjects do you see a difference or not this is one of the key problems that you would encounter in medical imaging that's one thing and uh, analysis of functional images this is something we have not touched upon in our course um, but this is again functional mri falls into this category there also a deep learning kind of approaches could be could have a lot of potential there and another important problem you have in medical imaging is combining the imaging and non imaging information how do you come up with the models for example you might be having a genetic data okay uh, these also you you find lot of publicly available data sets here 
where for example the inference is drawn over a period okay by the doctor through the uh, uh, diagnosis over a long longitudinal studies you have genetical information it's just one kind of information okay there could be other their family history of course that also could be due to genetics or could be due to something else as well and some observations by the doctor for example from the behavior of the patients they might be uh, giving you some information about that particular person so and then there could be some other uh, not necessarily amazing for example you might be doing a blood test for the patient and from that you observe some abnormalities in the blood and then on one side you have an amazing information and uh, within the amazing also you could have functional information you could have molecular level information you could have structural information and on the non amazing information you could have something coming from for example blood based tests something coming from genetics and from the treatment observations of the behavioral observations so how do you combine all these informations uh, how do you come up with models that can effectively combine the information coming from all these different modalities is also a challenging problem in medical imaging and in addition what we are going to see here are when compared to since most of you um, uh, have both the now at this point of time have some fair knowledge about uh, a overview of computer vision as well as medical imaging i am posing here uh, some challenges that are specific or more dominant or pronounced in medical imaging compared to the computer vision okay this is again there is a nice talk by professor daniel rukat so have a look at it uh, you type it ml in medical imaging so that's this again uh, i took some material from that and uh, one challenge here which you might have already noticed here by this time is the size of your data is very large okay um, for example in general there you might be having uh, images 2d images is a is a quite uh, common thing in computer vision maybe you will be having videos in some cases that to when it comes to tracking otherwise as far as detection is concerned and segmentation is concerned most of the times you are happy with your png and jpg images there on the contrary when it comes to ct scans mri scans 3d ultrasounds 3d pet scans we you have volumetric data here so the number of voxels and the features that you are going to extract here are usually relatively more than in in many of the computer vision problems that's one thing second number of images uh, for training is often limited i'm sure by this time you would have realized this as well so if, if you are a computer vision guy and if you say you have a large data set how many is what is it for you a large data set in uh, uh, computer vision how many images should be there so it's usually of the order of millions of images that you would be talking about on the contrary in a medical imaging when i say um, when i have for example 1000 images that itself is considered as a large data set and rightly so given the complexities involved here so what we consider as large for training is or what you could usually afford as a large data set uh, for computer vision is different for uh, medical imaging of course there are few exceptions in um, uh, medical imaging also for example that uh, uh, chest x rays uh, that has been i think uh, you have all seen i think it's maybe from stanford i don't remember the chexnet and other papers which are there that's one exception okay where you had millions of images that's a great job there and uh, this way there are few uh, few exceptions barring that if you are having something around 100 to 1000 images you consider it as a very large data set so when compared when you are adapting methods that are usually developed first are coming uh, the leads are from computer vision you have a small sample size problem here and another problem is training data is expensive so this also uh, should be very straightforward to uh, realize this uh, it's because 
say let's say you want to track how a car is moving or a pedestrian you want to track anyone can annotate that you and me and everybody in our course could annotate that on the other hand if we ask you to annotate uh, some medical imaging structures okay for example since anyway uh, we are talking about traumatic brain injuries so there is for example a, uh, intracranial hemorrhages i give you all ct images and ask you to label their intracranial hemorrhages i am afraid none of us would be able to do that and since this can be done only by experts even they also find it uh, um, time consuming and then a careful attention needs to be given there you could realize that the manpower cost and time because of these aspects manpower because only experts can do it cost because only experts have to do it and hence this is costly and then this is not just one slice you have to go through all the slices this is a 3d information so the time required is high so annotations of images is resource intensive here okay and the last point i would like to mention here is training data is sometimes imperfect say for example we are trying to make inferences Uh, let's say somebody is having alzheimer's disease okay but to this is what the expert doctor in that working in that particular specialized doctor from that particular area has mentioned but in order to perfectly confirm this what you have to do is you have to do uh, you 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 can only confirm it through pathology okay histopathology where you might how to take some samples or you have to go through some other kind of scans which are very expensive or those scans could be having some side effects like radiation for the patient in addition to the expensive scans that also is a problem and number of patients that volunteer you cannot force them to do this because of course the topmost priority is uh, the treat uh, the patient care and his comfort uh, um, and what can be afforded there so there is a, in case of certain there is a limitations lot of limitations and challenges in acquiring the data even assume that uh, in order to surely confirm that the so and so patient is having a specific abnormality you may in fact have to do some other tests okay to validate that sometimes it is not possible to do it on a live patient sometimes it cannot be afforded sometimes it could have an adverse effect or side some side effects on the patient so you will not uh, do that and sometimes patient might not be interested to volunteer for doing this so these are all the challenges which are more uh, pronounced when compared to computer vision okay so that's as far as the problems are concerned and then uh, when you are learning this object detection where you, uh, we anyway have seen parallel problems and what you have there so one thing is you go for similar to what you do in computer vision you could go for handcrafted features okay this is a common slide uh, that i found in many presentations so i could not immediately recollect uh, the source for it but again this is a, yeah this is a textbook slide you could call it shape features are there size features are there intensity based features are there shape features is for example what could be the circularity roughness uh, elongation compactness eccentricity i'm sure some of you would have used the these hand picked features are also referred to as hand crafted features even in your computer vision and then size based features area perimeter and then diameter major axis length and minor axis length if you are considering let's say it as an ellipse or something else and then intensity based features so what could be within the object let's say i want to perform a segmentation i would say what should be the minimum intensity maximum intensity mean intensity okay based on that i could find out um, uh, then try to get a segmentation of that and of course this is not just that texture based features also you could um, look into it maybe only few of you would have gone through it but still i'm just um, mentioning the names here that's good enough for the time being uh, like for example harlick features then gaber uh, gaber filters i guess you might have seen it uh, um, in uh, probably deep learning other deep learning courses then marco random field uh, based features are also possible these are all hand crafted features so once uh you had seen enough advancements 
in deep learning probably know this is how you feel uh, using these handcrafted uh, features there is a now it looks probably for you or for us all uh, for that matter as very primitive okay except in few very clear applications where uh, uh, the characterization of what we have to do is pretty straightforward and you could go um, with certainty on what exactly to be done there so that has brought here the cnn and other architectures again uh, by no means uh, uh, this is exhaustive we are just trying to have some flavor of the kind of things that you are going to do in the cnns uh, very generic one we are talking about let's say you have an input layer here where your image could be there and then you could have convolution and convolution layers that has for example convolution and activation so each one uh, you have these filters convolution filters whose weights you would like to find at the end of your whole process right and then the activation functions are there then you will be doing pooling kind of equal into subsampling your uh, um, uh, features or your image in a in a different way you are doing that and then of course you would be repeating that on the subsampled ones okay this is again we are just talking about the philosophy here of this so from model to model you all know even better than me and what all could happen here right and at the end let's say one possibility or, or one generic thing you could tell it as you are doing vectorization of these features again this could be varying from model to model um, but this is something you could say in general and then you have some fully connected layer where you take a call let's say here what you are going to do is um, you want to see which kind of abnormality you have it's an is it a normal subject or abnormality one abnormality two and up to abnormality n a given image slice so there you could have a architecture something similar to this right an input layer followed by you are going to you have multiple convolutions going on you are going to learn the weights of these uh, convolution masks then of course there is some activation function involved and of course here i am again not showing where you compare with your uh, ground truth results okay uh, during your training and back propagate it so there is a last function there is a back propagation all things could happen here but this is roughly uh, what you have as your convolutional neural networks right that's all with more than that i'm not going to talk much about these uh, um, uh, architectures as such that part i leave it to you um, more than that i i would rather uh, would be interested to uh, tell you about some success stories happening in medical imaging so this is already a, an old uh, um uh, it's an old slide i think at least slide by you could google that and see it maybe at least by few years maybe 2 3 years so that's giving you some startups that have clicked quite well in the area of transforming healthcare with ai so this is like digit uh, ai based healthcare systems okay that's what is telling you what is the impact of this medical imaging okay anyways in the course what we have discussed about is one segment of this for example that could fall into this medical imaging and diagnostics probably not even diagnostics we have looked at we mainly looked at the medical imaging part but when you look at it in a very generic situation where you are talking more at the level of healthcare there could be a different scenarios that uh, where um, this deep learning has shown promises very and also has already resulted in certain breakthroughs which were otherwise not possible earlier one such area is patient data and risk analytics okay you assess the risks in, in advance and you are going to draw some inferences from the patient data not necessarily imaging data here okay it could be from doctors observations or genetics or whatever it are the history of the uh, patient's uh, family and so on and so forth so that's one segment and then lifestyle management and monitoring nutrition um, uh, emergency room and surgeries ai making a inroads into that and making some significant uh, leapfrog jumps there 
inpatient care and hospital management so how do you manage like different kinds of management that you could do at a hospital level right uh, and then some miscellaneous variables okay this is another very um, uh, attractive segment virtual assistance okay this probably during the times of covid probably many more companies would have added here are the companies that were already there here might have done much better might have got much better profits okay then drug discovery is another big area okay and then mental health these are some of the and of course research um, so these are some of the um, areas okay so some of you who would like to start uh, your own company then healthcare with ai this sh this should convince you to an extent or they should give you a, a starting point to think over that this is not at all a bad area um, uh, where to begin with if you would like to uh, uh, like have venture into okay as an entrepreneur um, into applications of ai in healthcare so that's one thing and now what we can see now is some of the success applications that had happened um, yeah, so far in this area like for example these are some of the applications where uh, there are uh, 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 where there are already there is a significant uh, uh, improvements like for example this mammographic mass classification where there has been um, the results have uh, improved quite a lot in this area okay another one is brain lesion so segmentation of lesions in the brain and airway leakages has been another application and uh, diabetic retinopathy has been another such application and then breast cancer prostate segmentation skin lesion uh, classification bone suppression in chest x rays these have been the applications where the introduction of this deep learning has given you significant improvements in terms of accuracies in terms of reliability and other aspects say for example i am again not going uh, to go in detail into any of these applications but would rather mention a few so one of them being this lesions land okay this is again uh, nice to see here okay this has entered into the cover page of the nature uh, journal okay and this is in january 2017 nature pack so lesions land that was the thing say for example here uh, I, I maybe i'll there are different kinds of lesion classifications the idea is that you will have this is again another application where earlier as we were mentioning when you say large data set it's very rare you have data sets of the orders of millions one being chexnet that we were calling about the chest x rays okay another is this application this uh, you you take a photo of different kinds of uh, skin abnormalities and your deep learning based network should make an assessment on whether this is a benign or uh, is it malignant and what kind of lesion is that so that's what it has to do and uh, again those of you uh, who are already aware with um machine learning and deep learning based networks should already be knowing there is something called as inception uh, network okay again there were different versions of it it was also mentioned uh, in the landmark some breakthrough cnns that has happened so that's something that they have used around 2017 and i think that time that's among the state of the art methods okay so they, this is a very comprehensive paper they have done um, detailed evaluations and of course that's why it can get accepted into uh, the uh, nature journal as well i'm just showing you some sample images to draw some take home messages here like for example within this skin diseases one broad classification could be non neoplastic diseases benign and malignant okay and within that again there are different sub classifications here that you could see for example dermal epidermal and uh, melanocytic okay similarly you have within malignant also dermal epidermal and uh, melanoma and there were other classifications okay they did a very thorough evaluations there where even sub classifications that uh, um, one can do but just to uh, have a take home message from here um, they have not given uh, any of the history of that particular patient by history what i mean is 
they they might have given some drug to him or uh, a specific kind of ointment to him with that they might have uh, they looked at how it has uh, responded to that or some additional tests they might have done in addition to just looking at those images from that they will establish the ground truth and now what they will do for two different dermatologists let's say here they considered in their evaluation two different dermatologists who have the same information as the cnn has okay not having any further information and then look at the accuracy so this is a very broad classification accuracy where they call it as three way accuracy where the algorithm has to detect whether it's a benign lesion or a malignant lesion or non neoplastic lesion so what is interesting here is dermatologists uh, two dermatologists have an accuracy of 65.6% and 66% on the other hand the cnn and some modified uh, method of that that they have proposed in that nature paper achieved 72% of accuracy okay which is pretty uh, pretty good okay quite well uh, it is able to do that that's one success story of skin lesions okay another one is um was transfer learning has been i think many of you now know transfer learning quite well uh, this if i am not wrong they learned the initial weights and everything from the image net data set and uh, this is again in nature scientific reports published in 2019 the application being um, transfer learning based breast cancer detection so they had a data Uh, so they have a very limited data here uh, and they would like to again classify into they found that there is a tumor or not is on one side and on that they would also would like to see whether that's a benign tumor or malignant uh, tumor so within that breast cancer detection so detection is whether it is there or not and then you see which kind of tumor it is and here also they could reach for example again uh, i think resnet is there vcc net based things are there they could reach to accuracies of around 95% okay which is pretty good and again uh, this is something that talks about again you could refer back to this report okay and see in more details but all that i would like to wanted to convey from this uh, slide is the kind of network that is used here is pretty much similar to what you have been used to not very complicated one um, which is uh, very um, is very similar to the kind of networks you might be already using it but they had um, transfer learning has helped a lot in such applications where even they have a very limited data for training and have given extremely good accuracies again of course um, yeah, it's important to note also here um this is somewhat acceptable maybe in this at least in this application because uh, um uh, usually this is not the final test where they would confirm whether it's a um, uh, it's a cancer or not whether it is malignant or not once this is more like a screening test after that if it is positive here then they would go for a biopsy so that way if you look at it these are values are pretty good okay so Uh, what is important here is you should not be having uh, false negatives it's okay to have bit more false positives there so that's the thing here and uh, another uh, area is data augmentation which you have been using a lot so this is also as found as we discussed earlier the data uh, there is a scarcity of the amount of training data that you could get particularly in the medical imaging domain so this is something where how you augment your data say for example uh, this first one is a very interesting thing where you want to learn your machine learning or deep learning architecture um, uh, how to do a fourier inverse fourier transform or how to do a fourier transform the kind of thing that they did is they were taking 27 slices of your of the brain mr scans and on one side how they train it is they give the fourier transform as an in, to the input layer and it should compute the inverse fourier transform and give you the image in the spatial domain 
say for this, for example, during the testing, this is your ground truth uh, image that you should get. And if you are not, uh, if you are just using those 27 slices, this is what you would be getting at. And on the contrary, if they, what they did then is they made some transformations to this data, same data, they rotated it. Okay, they flipped the data and you know that, right? You made a uh, like a tr translation, rotation, flipping. Okay, all these kinds of things they did. Okay, for the simple experiment. And then with that, if you train it, it's able to learn better. The same architecture, of course, they have used it for this uh, uh, computer vision LENA image as well uh, with the same kind of, uh, with some variations to the image. And then without data augmentation with just 27 images, this is what it has reconstructed with, I think, very limited data that uh, they have done. Of course, the original image is not included, which we are testing. And it has done a pretty good job. So you could see here, data augmentation also plays a vital role here. And you could expect improved results with that. Right. So now we will make a move into looking at applications of this deep learning, specifically in MR imaging. So if you look at uh, the key problems, if you have to point, uh, point out in case of MR imaging, one important problem that you would be looking at is image reconstruction from undersampled case space. So the motivation for undersampled case space should be already clear for you uh, for MR imaging. The acquisition time is much, is very high. Okay, and even if you are ready to acquire for so long, there could be some movement in the object that's under scan, that's the humans itself in most of the cases. So because of that, there will be motion artifacts coming. So that motion has to be corrected. And then there could be other art. So you would prefer acquiring it with minimum number of samples. Can you reconstruct back the original signal? This is a very, very uh, important problem in MR imaging. Of course, it is equally important in uh, CT also, but for a different reason. You want to take minimum number of projections and from that you want to reconstruct your 3D image. The reason being, you could reduce the amount of radiation mm, dose that he has to, the radiation that he has to, uh, the patient has to undergo there. Here it is, you would like to reduce the time. You also want to reduce the artifacts that you would that get introduced because of the motion of the subject, okay? And image quality improvement is another very important uh, area that has a lot of scope uh, for improvement with the help of deep learning perhaps. So that's one is motion correction and artifact correction is another thing. As you could see, uh, the more high magnetic field you have, you have a lot of advantages there. Uh, some of them we have seen earlier in our MR discussion. I don't want to go back there. But while doing that, one problem that you would encounter there is having a uniform magnetic field throughout your gantry, okay? Throughout the board there, um, throughout the region where you are scanning is very difficult. So that would introduce, for example, intensity non-uniformities are of course, there will be in addition, there are also other reasons why you would be getting artifacts in the images. So how do you, uh, how can you compensate or get rid of these artifacts, correcting those artifacts using deep learning based approaches? That's also, there is a lot of scope, uh, means there is a lot of work that has been going on and still there is a lot of scope for deep learning. And another area is argon and lesion segmentations from MR images. This is also another area where there is a scope. And uh, now what we would see is some areas where we have to be extremely careful while using these deep learning networks, okay? This is something, uh, I don't exactly remember the reference for this paper, but you could all, I think this is there in uh, that uh, first, uh, the reference review reference paper that I have given you, 2019 uh, deep learning uh, in MR imaging. From that I have taken this. So what they did is, uh, you have this adversarial networks. So on one side, you give as an input, let's say the MR images of T1 weighted MR images. And on the other side, you give a set of PISAs. Each one you randomly pick something, a PISA that corresponds to this because it doesn't know what exactly is it. There is no domain knowledge here. And then you ask it 
uh, you give now in new in testing a new t1 weighted image and ask to synthesize the pizza from it okay you it, it could always synthesize a pizza uh, image for it uh, and of course you could do the reverse also you give as an input to uh, a pizza image and uh, then you ask it to synthesize uh, what is the corresponding t1 weighted image that will always give you something there whether it makes sense or not you know that pizza and this images you have randomly picked up some images and made them as pair and given it to through training and it has whatever you give it it will always find out some pattern and from that it gives you certain things but so maybe this experiment uh, in the outset when you look at uh, it might not make much sense for you but the kind of people uh, kind of things that one could uh, try is let's say things like that uh can we reconstruct let's say i have taken a ct scan from that let's say can i get a diffusion weighted image okay anyway we have not gone into different variants of mr imaging so the name should already tell you a bit that's good enough it's an mr image let's say and you have diffusion weighted mr imaging basically so given a ct image what you could train your network here is that you have in the training phase an actual ct image okay and a, in the training the actual uh, mr image that corresponds to that you give them during the training and what you are going to do here is for a new patient you give a new ct image and can it generate the corresponding diffusion weighted image so that it doesn't have to go through mr scan that's what you are going to do okay so this would perfectly um, seems to makes sense when you look at it from your deep learning architectures but clinically this is not going to make any sense out of it it's because certain things could be detected only from diffusion weighted images and this could be patient specific and whether that abnormality is there or not you could never infer it from the ct scan okay then it is obviously gets biased from whatever data you have in the training phase this is a very nice example where you do this whole process and you train your architecture this tells you that this is your diffusion weighted image okay this is what you have inferred from the ct image but if you take the actual ct uh, actual diffusion weighted image this is what you indeed have for example for that particular patient a uh, i guess a tumor here okay which can never be detected from there so while deep learning architectures all the developments in deep learning has helped quite so now you, probably it is making sense to you and why the earlier experiment uh, has been um, given where it is almost an exaggerated a slightly exaggerated case of it's like give a pizza as an input okay and get ct scan as an output and the other way around similar is this case in a way because the kind of uh, signal that is using and uh, the type of uh, uh, like the tissues that it is sensitive to is different when it is different and when that information is not available here itself it's a, an extreme way of saying it is it's like giving a ct scan and get an mr scan is something like give an mr image and get a pizza out of it okay pizza corresponding pizza image out of it and vice versa so one has to be very uh, careful with it because this is generates realistic fake images good for all your gan networks okay uh, but if you are using gan network here for medical imaging this is a sign of caution here be careful with that and be very sure it, it is not important here just to get an image that looks like mr image is not the objective here but the objective here is you have a very highly reliable detection of uh, the abnormalities is of prime importance here okay so that's the word of caution with that uh, then uh, i i'll not go through it in detail but i'll share it in the slides i give you which is telling you again this information um, uh, i have taken from this um, blog writing i found it uh, as a beginner uh, i found it interesting uh, and informative where they were mentioning what exactly is the novelty that they have brought in such that it has uh, been a breakthrough and uh, uh, has been a, a lead for further uh, uh, 
developments there uh, with further improvements in accuracies and all that part i leave that to you so yeah um, that's all uh, for this so we, we are done uh, with this this is the last lecture and i hope you find it uh, uh, informative at least some things i'm sure you already know it but you found the rest uh, useful here so any questions are there any questions here maybe i'll just pass the video here